introduction and thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with friends, old friends, and uh, I'll make some new friends too. So, um, uh, Dennis gave the title of my paper and essentially I'll be talking about um, the varieties of misogyny in our field with some historical kind of background. The degree of prejudice towards females in psychoanalysis can be assessed by consideration of the theory of mind that the therapist uses as that will guide his or her interventions. No one theory nowadays can claim anything like the hegemony that once was the privilege of the American ego psychological tradition in this country up till the 1960s. Therapists thus often have their favored theories according to the psychodynamic or ed analytic education and persuasions of their own therapists or analysts or supervisors or teachers. In the interests of eclecticism, People who don't belong to one school or another are often influenced by a range of theories of ego psychology. Um, you know, you know them all: Kleinian object relational, Bionian field theory, relational intersubjective theories, etc. They choose their theory according to how they judge a particular person's needs. Um, they were sort of. Um, left out of how to think about themselves until Nancy Chattero in 2004 and recently has articulated the American independent tradition. Psychoanalysts who are in the middle, much like the British independents, the progenitors she thinks of as Hans Lowalt and Ericsson. Their resultant hybrid influences from their creative work thus come importantly from ego psychology, but also interpersonal psychology of Sullivan and others, and where Hans Lowell too began um, in Washington, Margaret Mahler and Winnicott, whose research with infants fire the pre-edible imagination. And Lowell was also not at all averse to Melanie Klein. And with the added enrichment for Erickson especially, of sociology and cultural theory. That's been a problem to integrate or to have a notion of where do these all map together. So she calls it the American independent tradition, which she calls intersubjective ego psychology. Within these theoretical themes, Chaudhary calls a family of resemblances. In thinking about prejudice and women, there is also room here for feminism and its history and its impact on our cultural vision. Nancy's description was for me like a good interpretation. I feel strongly that we cannot address and keep open these important and intriguing issues of sex and gender in a patient's life without being able to think about the body, the family of origin and the culture and their interplay together in the psyche. So I own the American independent tradition that she names and other people um, you may like to join are Warren Poland, Ted Jacobs, Judy Chusett. There's a, a, quite a range and Nancy Coolish, um, uh, Diane Elise, I think would be there, Jerry Fogel, Richard Wright, Ken Corbett might own up to it. And, and I'm sure many others once uh, people it becomes a little more popularized, which I hope it will. Once we identify the theories we're using, then we can consider more closely how they deal specifically with the theories of sex and gender. Some like attachment theory, for example, considered this new to think of sexuality in 2006, or Chris Lovett in 2020, just a few months ago, presented what he felt was indeed a new insight for the Bionians, the notion that the container, which is of course a metaphor for the mother's body after all, is erotic. So, you know, there's a lot of issues about sex and gender that get left way on the back burner as well as the body. So um, sex and gender theory is still foggy in my opinion. 
My conclusion here will be that societally we have changed greatly for the better since the issues about gender inequality were forcefully brought to consciousness in the 1970s and as a result of the second wave of feminism and the social turmoil. This has diminished prejudicial dealings with women patients and women practitioners. No longer does one hear stories of female analyst Sands being told by male analysts that their quote penis envy is best dealt with by gratefully identifying with their husband's professional efforts and their support of him. Now that was from a friend of mine who was in analysis with Edmund Burglar, who I'm going to write about sometime in New York. He was a well-known analyst in the 1950s there. Or the only that the really only really important issue for a child's father image is how the mother communicates that to the child. Now that was from a child analytic teacher of mine who was absent from his own family a great deal and had a very angry wife. So it's just the old doozy that if it's the mother's fault, if the father is not revered as is his due. Only this myth can be served up damagingly as psychoanalytic theory. I have no you know, problem with it as an opinion or so on, but as psychoanalytic theory, it is, um, a real misunderstanding. In spite of societally influenced improvements though, our theories do lag very much behind our clinical dealings and the potential for clinical explorations of the body and gender, which are thus understudied, underreported, and therefore under theorized. I think, for example, we're still very vague about the different ways that little girls develop psychologically into mature sexual beings. The relationship of their varieties of gender portraits, for example, to baby making and the pathways for their choices of sexual partners. Their differing ways of mothering and being mothered the routes to the choices of different career paths and adaptations to aging. From studying Freud's psychosexual stages, we can say more about what does not happen than we can articulate about what does happen. There are many reasons for this fog, some of which I'll bring up today. It's emphatically not because women are secretive or secretive by nature. I think the fault is actually a lack or an inhibition of many modern analysts' curiosity, which then creates a foreclosure in the field's interests. Our original Freudian theory, while very misleading about female development, had some great virtues. It resulted in rich texts showing a deep and searching fascination with sex and gender. For example, in the interpretation of dreams or the studies of hysteria. In contrast, our newer theories hamper revisions of theory building about female sexuality and gender by ignoring the body of both sexes, their adult roles and their meanings. I think that after the 70, 80, 90, 80 period of questioning of authority of a theory, analysts who did not describe themselves as relationists uh, or turn against libido theory became embarrassed about the limitations of interpreting the female body as always lacking something. The male analyst, for example, could experience embarrassment or could experience it as a stricter a theory of reading women's complaints about their female bodies, always as if it was their thwarted desire to be male. Common complaints that might be misinterpreted could be, say, females reacting with alarm to their body fluctuations or weight gain or their dimensions after puberty when they no longer possessed a body that looked to a male more straight up and down like a phallus or their dubiety about too big or too small breasts growing beyond latency. Women patients themselves objected to analyst negativity to their tales of the sexual wonders of the clitoris 
And they knew that masturbation was very misunderstood in analysis, female mis masturbation. I'm sure we can think, and I would encourage you to think of some examples of the superimposition of a caste to an interpretation or a direction of analytic inquiry that's uh, served by kind of um, received theory sometimes. Black bodies, for example, I believe at the moment are at the forefront of a confrontation of our inquiry with ourselves in a similar way. Too much about the other can be assumed by whatever is the dominant culture. Much might be said about all this, but the time's limited. Female sexual appetitiveness or her jouissance, qua female, or her sexual arousal towards other women, all kinds of things. We can talk more about this phenomenon if you like. It used to be pondered over in classes as likely being due to a woman's unconscious masculinity. Libido, after all, was supposedly male. Some schools have noticed this obliteration of interest in sex in their working ideas and suggested ways to try to write it. Fonagy in 209, for example, regretted that reference, this was an interesting study, regretted that references to sexuality that were key to Freud's thinking had dwindled in psychoanalytic theory over the past decades. And he showed it vividly by statistical analysis of the recurring common words in the major journals over the span, the entire span of analysis. And you could see the graphs going down. It's very uh, graphic. I've been concerned too about this topic and I've elaborated it in recent papers. I'm always elaborating it, I think. The natal body and the confusion at 2019 paper in JAPA or my book and many other writings. In the aftermath of attacks by Michel Foucault in the late 60s and 70s, negative reverberations remain on gender issues, psychiatry, biology, mental illness and the medical profession. Some of it is, you know, definitely rightly placed. However, um, it can be extreme, which aroused hostility among psychoanalysts about French, uh, Freud's instinct theory. And that resulted in postmodern social constructivist explanation of sex and gender that purposely bypassed and ignored the body. Um, saying that biology is nothing. You know, we just heard the brain is, <laughs> without a brain, there is no mind. Without a body, there is no sex. There is no gender a formation in the mind. <laughs> the focus shifted, for example, to power relations, especially for enthusiastic po postmoderns in the relational school. Um, Kleinian and Bionian theories favor a concentration on rich but archaic fantasy preoccupations that to my mind also, for different reasons, continue to evade the very troubled and original model of sex and gender. The body itself in any biological essentialist fashion is certainly not the leading edge of gender enactments as it used to be thought but the interpretation of that body is. Some theorists speak as if the natal biological body does not matter at all, as psychic transformations progress from childhood to adolescence. This tendency is towards a group denial, I believe. Now the audience here will have many opinions about this issue, I'm sure. Uh, but having sketched and shared my attitudes and preoccupations that underlie this talk, that I'll, I'll finish this section. I'll now turn to the question of some evidence of what is static regarding misogynism and what is shifting culturally and within the psychoanalytic field. Female ideals, uh, child woman, uh, Dennis, are you prepared for the slides in a minute, second? The child woman in 1908, at the beginning of the psychoanalytic movement, so this was way back in 1908, 
characterized a sociocultural thesis about ideal womanhood. It was proposed and supported in Viennese coffee houses in circles by the young doctor Fritz Wittels and others of the avant-garde around the decade before the First World War. Now, if we could have slide one, please, of Fritz. Are we here? Yes. So the child woman is a reference to one of the main people portrayed in a book called Freud and the Child Woman, the memoirs of Fritz Wittels, edited by an English professor who unearthed these early writings. This consideration of ideal womanhood relates to my paper's topic about therapist prejudices about women's roles because the text is a source for the study of the psychoanalytic founders' mindsets in the original workshop for theory in Freud's Psychological Wednesday Society begun 1902, then developed into the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society in 1908. This group, as you know, functioned as a crucible for analytic ideas in statu nascendi. Otto Rank, the recording secretary of the minutes, wrote summaries of many of the oral presentations, for example, some by Fritz Wittels, including his tirade against women psychiatrists. <laughs> some papers by the young Dr. Wittels, according to George McCarry's 2-8 book, were too sexually outrageous even for Rank to record. Bittles was, I think, indulged there as a talented, quite amusing, if wild, unbuttoned youth. In that patriarchal male gathering, however, to the modern ear, there was much overt collusion with his misogynism, which they thought quite natural. To his credit, Freud viewed him nervously, fearing his reputation in Vienna could harm the young psychoanalytic movement. The child idea, child woman idea, uh, was first a paper given to that group. A paper, quotes, long on erotic enthusiasm and short on clinical evidence, according to a modern literary critic. Bittles, he was also Freud's first biographer, subsequently fled the Nazis in World War II to the USA and became a well-known psychoanalyst in New York in the golden era of the field. Continuing his early vituperation against females who dared to see themselves as separate from males, he was one of the shrillest voices in opposition to Karen Horney in the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. He helped expel her for heretical teaching in 1941. He died in 1950. His cry against Horney had been, quote, Freud and only Freud, which sounds theoretically conservative, but his getting rid of Horney was probably a continuity of his early hateful vituperative war against women. Littles helped popularize in the coffee houses a misogynist social theory that he claimed was a natural development of Freud's 1905 Three Essays on Sexuality. According to McCary in 2008, the Viennese coffeehouse culture, free love at the time, actually helped promote Freud's early ideas, albeit in a distorted fashion, where Freud actually felt misunderstood. For example, the coffee drinkers reasoned, get this, that if a man's anxiety symptoms were caused by coitus interruptus and having dammed up unexpressed sexual libido, you remember the actual neurosis, it was clearly a woman's, any woman's theoret therapeutic and biological duty to relieve this anxiety. Littles wrote, a 1906 paper based on Freud's discovery and Karl Krauss's philosophy on the criminality of forbidding abortion to women. It wasn't for liberal reasons. If contra the reasoning was, if contraception caused mental ill health, 
that is coitus interruptus causing anxiety, then women should become pregnant frequently to prevent being held back sexually, both for men's and their own sex. They should use abortion for birth control, not to interfere with male ejaculation. And of course, their own pleasure, all viewed presumably and entirely dissociated, of course, from anything to do with pregnancy, either its pleasure or its risks. Reading this paper with admiration, Freud invited Vittles into the Wednesday group. One target of this hostility was the child woman, Irma Karguska. Could you do slide two, please? This is Irma. She was a physically beautiful woman who had been a mistress of Karl Krauss since she was a teenager. A nemesis of Freud, Karl Krauss was the famous avant-garde editor of the sardonic paper Die Fackel, in which Wittel's article first appeared. The newspaper famously lampooned people established in the Viennese press. The thesis of the child woman was that this janitor's daughter was so sexually attractive that she was, quote, forced to begin her sex life with still a child. Fritz Vettels became a lover of Irma, then Krauss's ex, whom he tired of in 1901 and essentially handed her over to Vettels. The so-called child woman Irma had become a very, had come as a very young country girl to the bright lights of the city of Vienna and sexually enmeshed between these two socially prominent men. She was savaged with contempt by both of them publicly and in different ways. All her life long, Vettels writes, she remains what she is, oversexed, incapable of understanding the world of adults. Using Freud's terms, I explained that this type is necessarily polymorphous perverse, sadistic, lesbian, and whatnot. He, he includes his, quotes, floods of enthusiasm for her, quoting Helen of Troy, Lucretia Borgia, and others. He elaborates smugly on how, quotes, I spoke and psychoanalyzed Irma's soul. Littles, of course, was serving his own literary ambitions and trying to participate in Christ's life, I think. Irma passed from one man to the other, still seeming having loved Krauss, according to her diary, and felt abandoned by him. Could we have slide three to show Karl Krauss briefly anyway? Littles, however, yearned for Irma to love him. Freud's voice in the Tim's voice in the Tim's book to his credit is often critical and annoyed with the whole setup. But I will use Vittles on Irma to exemplify the influential ideas that helped culturally to co-create the important Freudian theory about women. Irma was an exceedingly promiscuous young woman. So could we go back to Irma, please? That's slide two. We'll get rid of Carl, yes. Vittles held that she was a Greek woman born too late into the Christian era, which hunted her down on moral grounds, a hetera, a courtesan, who demonstrated the destiny of a real woman, and she was a splendid example of what female sexuality should be, where it was, quotes, not only the right, but it was the duty of a woman to surrender to everybody whose appeal she felt. Citing Krauss, whose views he worshipped, quotes, women not only had the right, but it was a bounden duty to be whores. For Wittels, once a person had been truly liberated by Freudian analysis, Irma married four times. Wittels scoffed at the idea of her marriage and the silly man that chose her as mates. Contempt dripped from his pen towards her, but he seemed unaware of it. Quote, since Irma was sick and miserable and I was a physician, I made it my business to cure her. 
when she improved, one needed the energy of Hercules, the patience of Job, to prevent her harming herself by liquor and nightly es escapades. She was like a puppy. Finally, he says utterly dismissively and cruelly summing up her life, nobody could bear her long, although she looked charming and compensated her lovers at night for what she vexed them in the daytime by her immeasurable stupidity, lack of tact and complete absence of faith. Men withdrew, but she always came back to Christ, who could not extend the brutality to let her down. Finally, the little simpleton became fat as a stuffed goose, and about 25 years after, she died as suicide. One can see in Irma's diaries that she is neither simple nor stupid, but full of embitterment at Christ's abandonment of her and the withdrawal of his financial support. Fiddles held him in worshipful admiration for his writing, his biting wit, and so on and so forth, and they thought of each other as the greatest German living authors. In the camaraderie, they celebrated their views of women and how best to use women, what was her best use. Little's ultimate view of Krauss reads like a mirror image of how he himself writes. George McCary captures Freud's early confusions about the social implications of his sexual theory that he was developing. McCary believes that Freud used the experience with Vittel's irrational exuberance for social reform actually to help develop further his genuine theoretical point that developed out of that, that releasing id repression preferably then would be subjected to an adult's tempering conscience and decision making. I think, though, that all the men's breathtaking inability to attune to female experience and their certainties based on reading women so narrowly through their own desires is writ large in these struggles. Freud's morals were indeed offended by Bittles and Krauss, but he certainly did not dwell on their abuse of her, but rather called the victim Irma, the child woman, a tramp. Littles had a long track record of arrogant hostility towards women. He had been vocal in opposing Freud's advocacy for admitting women to the all-male Vienna Psychoanalytic Society in 1910, and Littles had voted against the acceptance of one of my heroines, Dr. Marguerite Hilferding. She was the first woman there. Freud and Bittles actually broke up in 1910 over the avidity of his push to misuse Freud's theory as a call to sexual social reformation, but they were reconciled in 1927. Freud's theory and this group's version of females as less than males in every way, their frivolousness, self-involvement, lack of creativity and so on. I needn't repeat it, you all know he wrote from time to time. The gross misunderstanding of the female body was a cultural misapprehension. The fantasy turned concrete that the literus was an inferior penis and the vagina actually was a wound. There are many references to, quote, the castrated female in the early literature. Not as if she were castrated, but the castrated female. Fantasy and reality became the same then. Can we have slide four? Uh, Bertram Lewin, please. Um, the next one, yeah, there he is. Jumping ahead to 1933, one of the best examples of the misogyny masquerading as theory is a paper called The Body is Phallus, written by Bertram Lewin. In that paper, every single, almost every case example was female. In each of the examples, I could easily point to references to a patient's experiences of inhabiting a female body within their associations, references to pregnancy, sickness, in dreams, to fears of childbirth, to screaming and being out of control, issues that were interpreted by Lewin as evidence of castration and of these women losing their penises. He didn't even say fantasy penises. 
Another feature of this paper is saying that we know thus and so. We, who are we? We, men? For me, this famous paper is a good example of a well-meaning and well-respected male analyst at the time whose lack of self-consciousness about the misogyny and the dismissal of the female body as female was nurtured and supported by his theoretical convictions. Now, we turn to Wonder Woman. Could I have slide five? Yes. Now, by way of 1941, see, I keep jumping forward. <laughs> and <clears throat> jumping again towards 217 and later, I look at another female idealized image, Wonder Woman, pondering what may have changed in Western culture and by extension, the culture of psychoanalytic theories that would therefore influence the way analysts form their interpretation of females. Introduced by DC Comics in 1941, in the Second World War, Wonder Woman came into being at a time when women were finding their strength in admittance to the workforce due to a shortage domestically of men. It was the time of Rosie the Riveter, the poster that called women to the munitions factories to make up for absent men. And then 217 is the latest uh, iteration of Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, um, but we, we can, yeah, well, that's fine. Wonder Woman, the most popular female superhero has an interesting history, which I can only touch on. It's enwrapped in the history of feminism in the United States and has roots to the fight for suffrage, the fight for contraception and equal rights of women. The creator who, that was a secret at the beginning was revealed in 1942 to be the psychologist, Dr. William Moulton Marston. And there he is. This doctor was brought into the business by the creator of DC Comics, himself a school teacher, to consult on the rising popular on the rising public complaints about the level of violence and sexual ferocity presented to children in these comic books with their exclusively male superheroes. Children read them avidly. Marston said that, quotes, since the comic's worst offense was their blood curdling masculinity, the best way to deal with the critics, and I think presumably still benefit financially from their publication, would be to create a female superhero. In 1941, Marston submitted his draft, and as Jill Lepore says in an article, in the Smithsonian in 214 quotes, explaining the under meaning of Wonder Woman's Amazonian origins as in ancient Greece, where he said that men had kept women in chains until they broke free and escaped. You can see her on the right in chains and breaking through. The new women thus freed and strengthened by supporting themselves on Paradise Island developed enormous physical and mental power. His comic book character, he said, was meant to chronicle, quotes, a great movement now underway, the growth in the power of women. Another psychologist, Loretta Bender, working in the Bellevue Hospital with children, also defended the exposure of children to the sexual aggression and sadism and cruelty of the comic superheroes having noticed how traumatized children especially love to dress up in their costumes, identifying with their protective power. Marston pointed to people's interest in freeing the chained, tortured females of the drawings more than dwelling on the torture itself. So one thread of the debate was that the comic books played the same role for children as formerly did Grimm's fairy tales. The influence of two more women with ties to our own profession was likely very much part of Marston's creation. So next slide, please. You can see these two women on the left. Elizabeth on the left at the top is his legal wife and Olive on the right was his mistress. 
And you can see them in the um, center. I, I don't know if my cursor does anything, but you can see the two old ladies up there um, and to the right of Wonder Woman. And this was after Marston died. They were inseparable. They were such good friends. So um, they all together, three of them. Um, she was, uh, the young one was a young polyamorous mistress who was said to be the physical model for Wonder Woman. And she was an ex-student of psychology whose aunt was Margaret Sanger. Now Sanger had been jailed for her, advoca her advocacy of contraception, but famously prevailed and saw in the legal introduction of the pill to the United States much later in the 1970s. Marston kept his domestic ties secret according to Lepore, but in a, a 1917, a 217 movie, a kind of docudrama with poetic license called Professor Marston and Wonder Woman, uh, characterized here in the poster on the right. Um, they said that he was publicly disgraced for that, but I, I don't think that there's any real evidence of that. Suffice to say that the female psychologists' attitudes supported vigorously the notion of empowerment of women. And they and Marston were also aggressively in favor of social and sexual freedoms, much actually like the 1908 Viennese coffeehouse clientele who created the child world, um, supported, uh, supposedly benefiting from free sexual alliances. The great difference in 1940s USA from 1908 Austria was that the emphasis was on the separateness and equality of the two sexes and the individuals thus consciously acknowledged a lot more about the ongoing uphill struggle of this advocacy. And that I see as the um, connection to uh, where we have um, emerged more today with the uh, great struggle towards the notion of, of separateness, but equality. And they believed, these people believed sincerely that it applied to women as well as men. So could we have briefly slide eight, which is Olive, who was the, um, yes, that she was the, um, her pedigree was a very feminist one, even uh, a Wonder Woman. She, she's the model for Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman's pedigree, I say, was feminist, even of her role in the Judiciary Council with Superman and Batman after she was admitted there, apparently was to be their secretary. Anyway, um, let's go on to slide nine, uh, Wonder Woman. Yes, there she is. And I'll very briefly, I don't know how many, if this was a live audience, I'd be able to say, you know, how many people have seen Wonder Woman? Well, maybe I don't need to retell the story, but I don't know uh, how many have seen it and how many haven't. Anyway, I'll quickly go over it. It's set in World War I, Diana. This was uh, Wonder Woman as a child was called Diana, a child goddess hero who will grow up to the superhero status of Wonder Woman is an Amazon princess on the all-female island of Themyscira. Her mother, Queen Hippolyta, the leader, supposedly fashioned her daughter out of clay and the god Zeus gave her life. So I think the, this uh, creation story is very interesting. But note the old imbalance. It's the men who really contain the vibrant source of life just like the Adam and Eve story. Zeus, the father, is absent, of course, in daily life. So she has essentially an absent father. One could say she's the product of a single mother. So she's a very interesting character um, being brought up by specifically by women. Um, so you could certainly say it suggests a modern family living communally, even with other women, also evoking fem the feminist 60s. Um, her girlish 
ambition is combat practice. And that's discouraged by her mother, but there's no injunction for her to be ladylike. And there's quite a difference here actually with Mulan. If people have seen the modern Mulan, Mulan is actually interestingly a very, it could be taken from uh, Freud's 1908 classic kind of edible um, sexual phases story um, where, uh, you know, she also is full of uh, wanting to do combat and so on, but the mother is dead set against it. And um, Mulan is really very identified with her father. She's a male identified woman in an edible kind of situation. But this is a very different um, portrait because Diana is a very female identified with the females that are around her. Um, because all of them are um, there. This is the image of femininity because they all have swords and um, you know they're ready for combat at any moment and so on. And um, so the group of all female Amazons needs to fight and defeat uh, pursuing enemy, enemy Germans that come right on their beach. I mean, this, you know, modern um, piece of uh, the First World War, uh, there's a crash on the beach and there's a very handsome pilot called Steve, stricken, of course, and they tie the ropes of truth around him and he tells all. And he's on some vital mission to end the war, to end all wars. And he has a formula for poison, trying to uh, get poison gas to take it away from the bad people. And he needs to give this formula to the English so they can save things. So this terrible world war in progress is new news to these isolated women Amazons. And Diana persuades her mother to let her go with Steve back to the human war Anyway, it ends up with her encountering the god of war and the enemy of all time. And it's if he, she defeats Ares with her power, she will become Wonder Woman. Of course, she defeats Steve, the handsome young man, um, essentially disappears into the horizon, um, dying um, with his plane filled with all the vile chemical weapons and he commits suicide for the good of humanity and the war ends. So Wonder Woman um, as Gal Gadot is, um, maybe we can uh, give us the picture of Gal Gadot next. Thank you. And um, she's still beautiful grieving for Steve, her impossible human love, but she goes back to become the uh, head of the Amazon female she takes over from her mother. So it's a story of a mother and daughter and essentially uh, a daughter growing into even greater powers than the mother and taking over all the inheritance of the mother. Um, so this portrait of ideal womanhood, which is a more dyadic portrait and very based on, on women, uh, the father being quite absent, um, it's remedial, I think, and meant to inspire young girls to feats of fortitude and physical strength and lively ability to outwit the enemy, no matter how powerful she should use her brains and her brawn from her own sort of magic and never be intimidated, be persistent, never daunted, be subservient to a male if he's evil. And it extends, the movie sort of extends it because <clears throat> even with her sexy partner, um, she um, has some trouble, which is actually consistent with having grown up with um, all females. She's curious about him, but she's very leery about him too. Her pursuit of individuality in her own right here is in the supreme. I see her as a figure of kind of um, growth and development, but uh, unfinished, you know, I had hoped there would be more evolution in her sexual and gender portrait as the next movie went on, but the next movie was a disappointment that way. But this was a good start. Um, so, 
her adult emancipation would involve solely intense competition with the image of her mother and her independence of spirit was very much uh, uh, celebrated in 217 here. So, but the only way to find this quality of individuality, interestingly, is only among women. Uh, so that's why I see it as an unfinished story. I, they haven't dealt really with the other 50% of the human race. And there's a quality of maybe having turned the tables some on all the stories of um, men and sons. And um, so uh, she's tempted to explore sex with Steve. And even more briefly, interestingly, in this movie, just for a second, she excitedly greets a baby in the street, such as she's never seen a human baby before. And then you think, well, her awareness of how a child is made with a male god giving life to clay that's being made by a woman. So... She seems able to imagine a love possibility with Steve along these lines, but of course it couldn't happen. And for now, at least, she needs to grow further by modeling her female body strength in a non-reproductive way, leading her physically powerful female group. So um, one of the offshoots of this in real life is that Patty Jenkins, the director, commanded for the first time in Hollywood, a salary equal to any male whose movie unexpectedly became a hit of the season. And that equality in a male dominated profession was a very, very long time coming. And as long precisely as the transition in female ideal image to Wonder Woman in 217, as from child woman in 1908, the length of time, the development of movies. And in 1908, the release at that time of movies that were called things like The Adventures of Dolly or Airy Fairy Lillian Tries On Her New Corsets or From Showgirl to Burlesque Queen or even a silent version of The Taming of the Shrew. So, um, Wonder Woman 2 was a big disappointment to me. It was chaotic. It's not even worth talking about. Uh, with a Trump-esque character who was the bad man and so on. And uh, it didn't really develop much except that Wonder Woman was a, uh, it developed a little more in her being a human um, anthropologist in the Smithsonian and um, she brought Steve back to life um, with a magical wish. And they had a sort of, uh, again, a stab at some kind of a heterosexual relationship. But of course, he had to die and disappear too. So that was the end of him. Now, I turn to um, some of the um, cultural reviews as representing ongoing hostility to women. So instead of using clinical material at this juncture, which I could have, but it's kind of awkward on the internet, I think, to describe a patient's account of her life story, her wishes, or a view of herself and her body, and then showing her struggles with con contrasting milieu or with the analyst's insights or the transference and the analyst's thoughts about her for a hopefully similar purpose I'm going to use the voices of some of the literary critics to demonstrate the impact and differing reading that a different lens can give these pictures of feminine ideals that I just outlined in their historical contexts. So perhaps you could be thinking along with some patient materials of your own as we talk. Think of the past historical family surround together with the patient's own reactions to their bodies and what you have thought of their conflicts in bodily, sexed, or gendered terms. Those will become some of the materials for internalization that apply here 
and affect the building blocks of whatever the female subject's contemporary or future developing body image may be. Now to go back to child woman, um, maybe we could, um, Dennis, could you bring us back to the child woman um, slide, if you can, the earlier. Looking at the contemporary male viewers of the Tim's book on Vittles, um, that shows ambivalence of their criticism. Yes, there we are. Leo Lansing in 1996, a professor of German, sympathetically reviewed this book, The Child Woman. That's 1996, not so long ago, in the German Quarterly, calling Irma a tart infect infested with venereal disease. And that's the classic position, I think, of blaming the victim. So how can she go from an ideal held up for relations between the sexes to a, quote, infested tart? Moral judgments have swamped the psychological atmosphere there, and the standards are clearly awry. Now, another critic that you'll all know is Adam Phillips, you know, the London uh, psychologist, reviewing the book in the London Review of Books, also in 1996, he cheekily called his article, Women, What Are They For? And he had this full on criticism to begin with. Uh, you know, I was in, in sync with this. Bittles, he said, the author of this fascinating, terrible book stands out in the minutes of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society by his aggrieved, rather hectoring omnis omniscience. In the memoir, A Bumptious Mea Culpa, he refers to, quote, one-sided and unjust way in which I flourish the shining blade of psychoanalysis. And then he adds, quote, it's the portrait of the psychoanalyst as a young idealist, a bit too impressed with his new sword. One can hear the beginning of a boys will be boys sentiment seeping through before he catches himself again. Ultimately, Phillips tries to evoke sympathy for Vettel's the era and his understandable horror of women's separateness, thus thinking of them as men's goods and chattels. As commentary, let's look at one woman, woman's letter to the editor. One writes, women, what are they for? I assumed the provocation of the title was ironical, then we find Adam Phillips telling us that before we condemn Fritz Crittles for his resentment of women having lives of their own and at their being sexually unavailable, quotes, we should consider whether we have never had this thought ourselves and what we do with it once we have had it. We, she says, oddly enough, no, we have never had this thought ourselves, but perhaps we are not included in Adam Phillips's we, in which case, I guess, we must be they. And to ask what women are for is obviously not for some men, an ironical question that came from a woman in Bristol. Phillips defends himself rather weakly, quotes, from a psychoanalytic point of view, it is more or less generally agreed that children of both sexes have a mother. When I wrote that everyone might once have grudged a woman her independence, I was referring to thoughts from childhood, when both sexes have these thoughts about their mothers. His respondent, to my mind, actually gets to the heart of the problems in psychoanalytic theory over the century. As she replies, of course, children of both sexes have a mother. Do we need to have that corroborated from a psychoanalytic point of view? <laughs> she said, some people, however, think that there is a difference or multiple differences between the relations that the two sexes have with their mothers. 
and that if both women and men are ambivalent about women having lives of their own, then they are ambivalent in different ways. So I think that was very well put. The lay public are capable of more than we are sometimes. It's interesting how denial of the sexual differences persists, even in sophisticated therapists like Phillips, who is taking a tack that's common these days, evading the adult sexual components of the interaction as meaningful in their adult communications and swerving overly eagerly into evasion into the territory of the archaic and underrepresented aspects of early interaction of psychic life. Um, now we turn to Wonder Woman. Uh, so maybe you could bring us back to Wonder Woman, Dennis. Sorry, they're so far apart. The reviews of the original Wonder Woman movie are quite positive, celebrating the woman director in particular. There were Oscar rumors, but it got very dissed at the Oscars that year. But here is a blog that's pretty common by a David Edelstein of New York Magazine who focused his gaze on Gal Gadot. Maybe we could, could we have the picture of Gal Gadot? as a star turn because he said she was the perfect blend of super babe in the woods and mouthiness. About her being an Israeli, he declared, they are a breed unto themselves, claiming, he said, this in admiration. He decried the lack of kinkiness like S&M of the early comic books. This writer asks, quote, what good is a female superhero if she doesn't make moviegoers slobber? Clearly, we were ripped off by that damned female director. Edelstein suggested that the good reviews of Wonder Woman have been just so because it's politically correct to praise a movie with a strong woman. So, um, that was, let's see where we go from here. He was enough to, to. So uh, the female director um, uh, really was sort of getting lambasted. Uh, the female director got lambasted by a lot of uh, people because they viewed in certain ways that this Wonder Woman uh, was too um, sort of pure. Another critic who disliked Wonder Woman, and this is another um, uh, kind of attitude to it, was the movie director, James Cameron, who uh, of course is James Cameron of the Titanic. And he said it was tedious and sexist and likely I would think he was in high competition with this female woman blockbuster director whose movie competed favorably with his Terminator 2. So it was the old story, clearly. She was the unworthy one and the lacking competitor. Now, where are we in psychoanalysis? You can leave this Wonder Woman up. Symbols of sex and gender. Irma was physically beautiful, oriented towards men, you can remember the picture of her, heterosexual, dependent, described in consequence, it seems, in male self-serving ways, a sexually overly giving, lacking in intelligence, maturity, control, autonomy. She could deservedly, unexpectedly be treated with contempt by men. She was not accused by them of ball busting, sadistic, or being against them, or castrating, or attacking, such as more independent females are described. In other words, they didn't accuse her at all of aggression. So she was very malleable and masochistic, which um, then she was lambasted for because um, it was she was stupid and so on and so forth, which suited the Krausian philosophy of women being ideally at the sexual service of men. Um, uh, 
Irma's aggression seen in her diary was ultimately turned inward and self-directed. It's a very interesting book actually, because it has this, these pieces of her diary in it, which are really very sad and um, uh, show you aggression turned inwards and the internalization of these terrible portraits of herself. Wonder Woman certainly is a very overtly aggressive figure in combat and beautiful, physically powerful woman in a modern movie, the opposite of being controlled victim, tied in a rope. She uses her ropes vigorously to extract truth from enemy males. In the old days, or even now, I think all of this projection of power can be, and certainly would have been dubbed without question as phallic power. And one could definitely make a case for a lot of phallic power here. However, she lacks the um, interaction with males that would have uh, contributed to this. So it's very dubious what kind of power it is that we're seeing here and it's more open-ended. Um, so let's look at Wonder Woman as the analyst Edmund Burglar might have in the 1950s. The analyst who wrote sincerely that all dress designers of female clothing were gay, thus explaining so-called hideous haute couture garments as symbols of gay men's hatred of women, which is patent rubbish. In the world of fixed symbols, frozen time from the phallic world of Vienna 1908, such as was Bergler's writings, um, and also in many analytic theories. Wonder Woman here is dressed in leather they would have said that's male skin and she carries a sword, definitely a penis. She looks fierce and with long black hair, she could be imitating with evil intent a male. As we know, anger is a male affect and it marks a woman as such, possibly with stolen male genitals and clearly male pubic hair, the black color of devils or, you know, she's quintessentially castration, Medusa's snake-like head image. More, uh, but I can say a little more in a moment about that. Those big fancy brassy bracelets, her forearms are like double uncircumcised penises, don't you think? And she has two big phallic sticking out breasts, etc. Her fight with the war god expresses her unbearable penis envy and that is the real reason she clearly wishes to castrate him and men in general. So note well, the fight has nothing to do with any provocation of his evil intent. She is clearly a lesbian man killer. That's likely why women and feminists in particular like her. A modern view that would encourage more curiosity, I hope, in the exploration of the female body symbolization, it would primarily really listen to Wonder Woman's own associations as if she were on the couch and not rush to judgment. I could imagine that the gold outlining on her costume that points to her genitals and draws one eyes to her breasts may be female enhancements and a guide to where she wants one to look appreciatively at her female body. The tight leather emphasizes her female form. Breasts are very interesting. I think the notion of them is phallic, just because nipples point out is borderline ridiculous as far as building a gender portrait is concerned. Most women talk in association about breastfeeding and their breasts about the pleasures of penetrating the infant's mouth and the sexual stimulation that that also affords. So there is a female, the qua female form of penetration that really doesn't rely on a penis. This is an attribute of the breast and feeding a birthed infant. It's the most female of acts. It has little to do with the penis except via male projection on a woman's body or a woman's seamless merger, which can happen with that body comparison. 
In the same way that the belly and hips have multiple associations with special female attributes, signals of being pregnant or involvement of adolescent growth into womanhood or of being prepubertal, youthful and nubile and projecting what females think of as sexually attractive either towards other females or towards men. Sometimes sexual and gender ambiguity is the emphasis of a symbol one needs to listen open-endedly. And I believe one needs not to think exaggeratedly separately about sex, as opposed to melding it with the biological procreation potential. It's to divide them so vividly uh, creates uh, sexual issues about the body that also overlap as procreative uh, images that uh, doesn't allow us to consider those in tandem. Um, could you have the next slide, Dennis? Uh, yes. So this, of course, is the Medusa head of the female genitals. It results from a male interpretation. It's supposedly male fear, male fear of the unknown hidden in a woman's body. Freud was very clear about this in 1925. And in a woman, it'll be more complicated. So I'm not saying that women don't have these fantasies too, but it's something different. It's maybe more complicated because the source of the instantiation of seeing herself or other females as Medusas will most likely have been a merger with an admired or feared male figure who himself feared females. Freud relates the terror of the Medusa and her stare that turned men to stone to a terror of castration that's linked to the sight of the adult vagina. The hair on the Medusa's head is frequently represented in works of art, he says, in forms of snakes. And they, these once again are derived from the castration complex. The snakes being multiple penises comfort a man by companionable bodily familiarity. Freud is very clear that these are male fantasies. That, that I have found um, that Freud is often very clear that what he's talking about is emanates from males. I actually have, I have never heard a female express this form of fear in relation to her own or another woman's vagina or even her mother. And I'd be extremely curious if any of you have heard it from a woman. Um, I'm open to, you know, I may not have um, attended to it or I somehow may have, my patients somehow may not have been troubled by it. Female fears of penetration form an oversized or caricatured penis tend to be much more common and may result in dreams of vaginal and vulval denial of being doll-like, naked, and closed up in the perineum. Anyway, there's a lot of variety of, of once we begin to think about it. In summary, we need far more documentation of women's alertness to their own bodies as a level that allows for female symbols of fierceness, aggression, and thrust as could apply to Wonder Woman. I've certainly heard from the couch such fantasies in rich conjunction to memories in female of ch in childbirth. And some here will know that I believe childbirth has been erased practically entirely from our modern theorizing. A female may in addition, of course, have male body associations to war, swords and so on, but one needs to trace the sources with her be alerted to surprise and not jump to conclusions about her development. Mine is a modern plea to approach such wonderful imagery with curiosity, openness, and expect to notice elements that you've never noticed before. Misogyny above all leads to a tragic foreclosure of the power of all of our imaginative responses. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be very interested in your response.
Rosemary, you're really a historian to go back to this early work, which um, certainly I knew nothing about. And um, I really appreciate that, you know, some things have never changed since then. <laughs> Maybe a little <laughs> bit, but not much. But uh, as, as um, you know, but I'm not sure everybody knows, I, I wrote a rich review of Rosemary's book about the pregnant woman, et cetera. And um, I don't know, do you think that there's been a lot more papers about the woman's body as body and its meaning since then? I, well, you know, maybe I'm so narcissistic. I haven't seen so much about it. I, I, it, it remains that, that um, the, you know, Joan Raphael left in, in London um, writes a lot, but she specifically deals with women and women's issues. There haven't been so many, or as Stella Weldon was another that writes about these year, good papers about pregnancy and um, Mother Madonna Hoare, you know, this, these kind, and she did a lot with um, uh, very violent women and extreme violence and working in prisons and so on. But I haven't seen, no, I haven't seen a ton of work about uh, people's interest so much in pregnancy, although people often say when I'm around, you know, they'll tell me about um, a lot of interest so that I think that there's an interest in the clinical work. But I just think that people don't write uh, they don't tend to write papers about it so much. They tend to become more abstract when they're writing or they, I think another trap is to um, view the body as quotes, concrete. And I think that the word concrete in psychoanalytic parlance uh, already kind of stimulates people to think, oh, that's some sort of inferior thinking. So we have to make superior thinking if we're going to do theory and we must leave out the concrete, you know, and maybe it's concrete, but maybe we misuse the word so that we have to find words so that we can include biology and, uh, you know, our, our ways of relating to each other in using our five senses, really. Uh, as uh, in biological terms. Anyway, no, I haven't seen a ton of papers, but um, you know, people like Ricardo Lombardi write wonderfully about the body. I mean, there's an, there's an interest in the body itself, I think that is much more vibrant than it used to be. Uh, at least people will mention it. <laughs> but they don't tend to dwell on the detail or the micro detail in the way of, um, you know, like Leonard Shengold, for example, in his work with trauma was very involved in the micro detail of the bodily references that he heard. Um, he didn't theorize about the body itself. He accepted the Freudian theory, but he, he, um, attended to it very closely. Uh, and then of course was interested in theorizing about trauma, you know, and soul murder and so on. But um, so I, I don't, I think we still lack a kind of, um, I still hope that, you know, that somebody can <laughs> come up with a, some sort of uh, more uh, cohesive, uh, um, set of uh, patternings of uh, how various uh, patterns in women's development uh, emerge and so on. And I have not heard any child cases that uh, talk about, um, you know, specific relationships to um, female children, to the bodies of their pregnant female caretakers which I'm fascinated by, and I think they must know a ton that they haven't spoken about, you know, that they brush over and they theorize in some other fashion. So anyway, what do you think, Brandon? I mean, do you, 
Well, I, I was just thinking that here in Chicago, I don't know if you know of the work, speaking historically, of Teresa Benedict, who was very interested in the, the menstrual cycle, and she was able to uh, make all kinds of psycho psychoanalytic theories about a woman's cycle. So that we have a little bit of that here long ago, but not nothing recent. I don't know, there's a few. Molly, do we, anything about um, child? Any child people writing about it? I think you're there, Molly, are you? Can't hear you. And she's muted. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I don't know of, except except for body dysmorphic syndrome among pre-adolescent girls, which there's a huge amount now. That's right. Um, and there is a little bit of conversation um, among little girls who have been adopted, who have a different image of what bodies can do and bodies can be or can't be, um, that I'm aware of because of my interest in, in working with um, uh, kids who are, who are um, conceived using ART. But other than that, I, I, Brenda and, Rosemary, I don't have anything that I can. I, I would be very interested. To. I'd be very interested in that, um, um, you know, specific thing about, you know, they and they, uh, they are they artificial reproductive stuff or adoption yeah. about, you know, they the notion of what bodies can and can't do, just what you said. Like, I'd be so interested. Maybe if you think of a paper that you could uh, send me a reference, I would love I to. I sure will. That. I sure will. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, um, the, the one of the kind of vicissitudes of our um, coming up with ideas, I think, uh, that you know our tendency to of course you know when we see massive pathology it sort of hits us in the face and we can't get away from it but then it's really pathology with a capital p but there's no there's nothing kind of quasi normative that uh <laughs> is it's difficult then to make judgments about it when we don't have a sense of, uh, you know, what happens when it's not on the forefront, but when it's very much in the picture, but not the focus of symptoms, per se. So, um, you know, the, the, one of the things that sort of started me on this route was, um, <laughs> this was a long, long time ago, I... Um, responded to a paper of Kirsten Dahl's. You know Kirsten? I mean, she's a dear friend of mine. She's a wonderful child analyst in New Haven. And she had a paper in the, um, she had a paper in the psychoanalytic study of the child called uh, First Class or Nothing at All. And it was about a young girl, um, maybe, <clears throat> uh, seven or eight or something and this young girl was like hell-bent on <laughs> being uh, male and how terrible that she wasn't male and so on and so forth and you know it was a very classical paper and very compelling and certainly it was in the material I mean there was nothing imposed on this material but in the margins um um there was very little about um, what was happening with her mother. So one of the issues in this was a clinical se session where the child would climb up on uh, Kirsten's knee and Kirsten was wearing a shawl and she would want Kirsten to put the shawl around her. And because, you know, this is a topic that I'm very interested in pregnancy, immediately, of course, I would think she wants to be in her belly, she wants pregnancy. So I brought this up 
at some level, uh, you know, because it was interpreted more in terms of, I think, comfort and so on. And um, Kirsten said, well, well, yeah, you know, um, that's right. She said uh, her mother was pregnant. <laughs> so all this time while she was going on about, you know, the mother was pregnant. And um, Kirsten said then she started to talk about the use of her shawl. And she said that, which she had left out of the paper, that the girl would bring her every time she saw her to weigh her. And she would weigh Kirsten at every meeting to see if she had gained weight. But this was clearly a reference to the pregnant mother, you know, and somehow there was far more, you know, uh, play and everything about phallic objects and one thing or another. And the child did have a brother somewhere along the line, too. So she'd seen plenty of penises. But, you know, as an avoidance of the, the sort of, there was seemed like a collusion between the therapist and the patient of an avoidance of this big adult pregnant woman that was the mother that seemed to me to be dominating everything. So, we, you know, we discussed it and we had a lot of fun with it, but it, it really, uh, you know, it, it, it's, if it's not on the forefront, if, if people don't think about it, it doesn't come into the material much. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to me how dangerous women are. I have become recently very interested in Julia Kristeva and, uh, I don't know if you know her work, but she has nothing direct. <laughs> you know, it's difficult. It's very poetic material. I mean, she has marvelous things to say about the terror of separation. I don't know if you know the work, The Power of Horror. Yes. <laughs> no, Julia. And I think that, you know, she knows something about why all this danger to for women as well as men to think about this much more than we do that there's a kind of horror of the object of the um, I mean the birthing process really if you stand back from it you know it's pretty horrendous you know if you're not the one that's given birth but if, you know if you were an outsider and you just sort of blew in. <laughs> it it, it um, looks pretty startling. Um, anyway, anybody else have thoughts? Or? Well, there are also a number of women analysts now who have been pregnant and continue to work. And you know, we, we haven't seen a lot of a lot of papers about that either. Well, I've seen a few more of those. There's, I, I was um, part of a discussion a couple of years ago with a wonderful young woman analyst called Megan Poe, who had a very vibrant, um, I don't know if she even published it. I mean, that's another thing that sometimes people will tell you things or they'll write something for a more intimate setting if it's to do with their own belly and their own, you know, whatever. And then, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't see that then in the journal, you know, uh, which is another way we, uh, it's very natural, you know, to, to, to not sort of expose it all, I suppose, but uh, it's, it's a pity <laughs> for our theory and our knowledge. Oh, I was just thinking, uh, Rosemary, about uh, what you were the, you were speaking about in this clinical example of the the essentially the the therapist is negatively hallucinating out the pregnant body, and and why are we as analysts, whether men or women, we're negatively hallucinating out the body and obviously sexuality. And as Peter Fonagy, I remember when he spoke about that research, mm -hmm. there's no sex in um, 
in our analyses and what do we make of this? I mean, I know you spoke some about the lack of curiosity and some and in the uh, in the analyst and, and the inhibition in the analyst that may be contributing to this foreclosure in in analysis in right analyses. Yeah, um, what do you think of that idea that um, people became sort of embarrassed to bring up? I mean, that's definitely one of the things that modern trainees say. You know, if I listen to somebody at Student Health Service, you know, somebody early green, uh, you know, trainee and so on, talking on this student will be talking about, you know, um, is life worthwhile and so on and so forth and various things, you know, she's thinking of doing and maybe even doing to her body or uh, attacking, you know, her femininity or female parts in certain ways, you know, and I'll say something about, um, you know, the student will be talking about creating an atmosphere of safety or something, which is terribly important. It's not like these things are not important, but they, you know, I'll say, but it sounds like, you know, X and Y about what she's saying that maybe masturbation is a great trouble to this person. And so, and, you know, when they, I'd say, you know, would you ever think about trying to phrase or let's co-create some way of trying to ask this young woman about her masturbation. And the, you know, invariably they'll say things like, why, well, I'm not sure I could do that, you know, or a man, uh, a male supervisee of mine, a much more sophisticated, he said, you know, I, I'm afraid to say something to women these days about, you know, if, uh, what about, you know, anything about sexual arousal in case they would think I was coming on to them and, you know, I might be harassing them or, you know, that there's such a tension about um, doing what Freud uh, advised us to do long ago. I think he, had, you know, he said, you know, be very practical about it and very straightforward and simple and practical. And, um, but that that sort of technique, that art has kind of disappeared. I, I had um, a bunch of, um, like sometime I might try to write about it, but it's um, a bunch of uh, patients um, applied, to, you know, to the psychoanalytic clinic. We have an old fashioned psychoanalytic clinic for low fee people, and we have a written application. And there were in the basement and, you know, I had helped to destroy them and so on, but there had been records there from the 1960s uh, and quite extensive records and we had to sift through them to destroy them but we saved little parts of them but they're really amazing that in the 60s and 70s people would say uh, tell me they would say things like tell me about your dreams people never say that to patients these days or uh, you know, tell me about, um, you know, your lovers. I mean, they wouldn't say, do you have a girlfriend? You know, they would say, tell me about your lovers or how is your love life going? Or, uh, you know, um, you masturbate in the evenings or something, you know, sort of <laughs> every day, you know, practical sorts of things. And um, they, um, so... However, the patients were coming in saying things like, I would like psychoanalysis because I'm frigid. <laughs> Nobody these days would come in and say, I want treatment because I'm frigid, you know? It's sort of the style of, then I noticed that the style shifted in the late seventies and so on. And people were saying, um, I think I need to take a moratorium I have, uh, I think I have an identity crisis, you know, so there's, there's a shift in, and then um, 
people were complaining about narcissism, you know, or I, I'm too narcissistic, or I can't stand my boss is narcissistic, everybody narcissistic, you know, there, there's styles according to the years. And then the therapists also are a function of that culture too. So they get focused on one thing or another. So in the older day, because of the theory, people were more naturally focused on that and they might have done a lot more if they had been less culturally biased. You know, they, they could have learned an awful lot more. Um, but now how do we get back to some of that without losing, you know, our interest in the archaic or our interest in trauma or whatever? And, uh, So I don't know if anybody else has noticed that over the years. You said you said you you, t did, you told me that you had um, another thing people tell me about or um, you know I never brought that up with my analyst. You know I never told him about my childbirths, for example, or I never told him about because he you know I said well why not? Well I didn't think he would be interested. <laughs> You know, I mean, like you know, sophisticated people. Yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. Rosemary, I want to go back to the question, Brenda, and you were talking about around pregnancy, because I am freshly aware of how frightening the birth process might be to men. I have a an adult man in psychoanalysis who's wife is pregnant with their uh, six months pregnant with their first baby and he came to his um, analytic session just infuriated with the doctor who told him that his wife probably shouldn't drive for six weeks after the baby's born and he had a temper tantrum on the couch because he said People in Africa drive the day after they give birth. I mean, he really got <laughs> quite um, histrionic about in, in a way that was very fearful. I asked him, what did he know about the changes that were going to happen in it or were happening in his wife's body? Uh -huh. And he <laughs> knew nothing. He knew how the baby got made. And beyond that, he knew nothing. And when I asked him, he said, well, I think it's a little bit frightening for me. I can't relate to it. And so there's, that was a very profound statement to me that yes. he could not relate to his wife's experience. Right. Um, and it, so I think the, the fertile woman is a frightening, frightening concept psychoanalytically for some some men I, I don't want to make any kind of generalized statement no, i can't but yeah i, but, but uh, I think that mm -hmm. the idea of the woman having the power to give birth is frightening well i couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> i i mm -hmm. think i think that it is you see i mean i think we got focused for a while on that the source of the fear, you see, was the Medusa head or the vagina or whatever. But the vagina is just the entrance to the whole kind of power structure, really, that's beyond it. Right. <laughs> and the unseen power, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And the, the notion that I think it's so interesting, these things, like even in Wonder Woman, that, that Zeus is seen as the one who gives life to this inanimate thing that's clay that comes from the queen, you know, that it's the man who gives life. And uh, that's such a reversal, you know? Of, I mean, they even say these days that they, the sperm, it's the egg that actually chooses the sperm <laughs> and uh, sort of uh, immerses itself in particular sperm and then holds on to the sperm, you know, that the, the force is, certainly is as much from the egg as it is from the sperm to unite. And um, I think that there's something is extraordinarily 
mystically frightening about it. And I think it's only- That's a good phrase, mystically frightening. I think it is mystically frightening. And I, I certainly have not explored what this, got, this patient's fantasies are about what birth process is, but I want to thank you because now I have a million ideas right. about how to listen to him. Yeah, and then when you listen to him and it's with you and you 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 started the idea anyway with him, you know, he'll <laughs> kind of let us hope he but can. There are changes in his, right, right. <laughs> Emerge into it. I was, uh, he did say, he did say, I was very angry with you yesterday because you wanted me to know about my wife's body and I wanted you to focus on me. I'm the one having the baby. And I just let that hang in the air. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, maybe that signals to be hopeful rather than <laughs> it's all about him, that yes. he's actually merged with her and he's so merged that he's having the baby, but he doesn't know how merged he is yet. <laughs> and then he can't bear to look at it because it's too, it, it's already too deep for him. Mystically frightening. Mystically yeah. frightening, right. Um, I, when, I was, um, I, when I was a candidate, there was um, a, a fellow who was graduating, Alan Gerwitt, I don't know if you remember, anybody remembers him. He was an analyst uh, subsequently in Boston, but he uh, wrote as his graduation thesis. I thought this was a real kind of innovative paper. He wrote about <clears throat> a young man who was pregnant, you know, like, so-called pregnant with uh, his wife was pregnant and he wrote about this guy's identification there's a that paper is in the psychoanalytic study of the child it must be in the 1970s the guy is Gerwitt I think he's subsequently deceased but um one of the things that I remember talking with him about is you know here people for decades, male analysts for decades had been seeing male, young male um, control, you know, young male um, candidates on their couches. And they must have had, there must have been hundreds of their wives having babies all over the place. And it never appeared, not a iota of information was there about a man's reaction, a young man's reaction to his wife's pregnancy. So Alan's paper was one of the, I, it was certainly the first paper that uh, he, uh, I, I don't think it was sort of celebrated enough that people recognized how important that was, but it seemed to me a sort of breakthrough that, uh, but the, it's not a subject, but it's got to be, all over the place. I have a supervisee also who is a young male and a young Indian male and just fabulously interesting with all manner of cultural issues yeah. and so on. And uh, this, the wife is pregnant and uh, he's, um, he actually likes to talk about it um, and feels that uh, this is the only area of privacy. He's <laughs> analysis for him is like some sort of secret private area that he can actually verbalize all sorts of stuff because it's not um, spoken about so much. Uh, certainly many cultural, many social reasons not to do that in public, but, or to, foreigners or to people who are etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's a yeah it's a very interesting time of life yeah you know rosemary your some of your your walk down memory lane of the way the psychoanalysts got away with talking about women that was clearly counter transference fantasies but no one was monitoring no peer reviewers, nobody was saying, wait a minute. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the same phenomenon with gay men, lesbian women, and trans folks that mm -hmm. who's monitoring these, and why do we just pass on some of these theories that are clearly 
fantastic countertransference fantasy based. Right. Although that we're sort of part of the, <clears throat> you know, we're part of the problem and not part of the solution as peer reviewers. We, if we share the same fantasies, I suppose we don't think it's fantasy where we, we think this is the way people are. <laughs> You know, we don't recognize we're having fantasies until somebody stands back from it and says, hey, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> this is not universal. Uh, you know, I, uh, what, what particular things did you have in mind about the gay and lesbian women and the trans? Well, it's all being stirred up again with the... Uh... Yeah. Vulcan and Socarides and that wacky period of psychoanalysis right. where they got a free pass. I think people talked in the hallway, but nobody publicly said, this is nuts. Just like what happened with women in the earlier years, nobody loudly said, this is nuts. This is all countertransference. This isn't theory. Right. And it's, inter it's always fascinated me how that keeps going and how supposedly well-trained analysts could weave books out of their fantasies and call it theory. And nobody would say, no, not quite. Right, or what does it take? I mean, what is it? I wonder what it means to share fantasies as a group and to normalize the fantasies. I mean, there's something about, the pressure to so-called normalize things that then becomes, it obscures what's going on, you know, because more of a group pressure to to be in the know or something. I don't know what, what are you, you probably have lots of theories about how, how these fantasies come to be shared and not recognized as counter-transference fantasy until somebody, down the side. I mean, how do, how do people, it fascinates me, how do people manage to stand outside and say, I mean, Freud managed to stand outside dreams, for example, and say, no, no, they're not, they don't foretell the future. You know, they don't, you know, he bucked the trend on a lot of things, um, but he certainly didn't do anything for women. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in that process, I think he also shortchanged males. I mean, some of that uh, work that's uh, being done about um, males and the um, interior space of males and all that, you know, was overlooked. It was sort of as if men were only nothing but rock hard bone and muscle, you know, <laughs> it was supposed to be like some kind of walking erect penis, you know. <laughs> So I don't know, you know, it's very, it's a very aggressive ideal, you know, when you come to think, I mean, Oedipus, I don't know if anybody else has some problem with Oedipus as a, a sort of like our shibboleth identity badge. You know, we all know about Oedipus and if we don't recite Oedipus as the, you know, some kind of central factor and everything, we're um, you know, there's something not quite there. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you think of it, you know, two men, a young man attacking an old man, <laughs> he doesn't even know on the roadside and, you know, but uh, I mean, it's a romantic thing, of course. I mean, I understand it's only a myth, but it did, co it comes to mean a lot more. I mean, it's to your point about how do things get passed on and mm -hmm. even treasured, you know, when some parts of it are patently rubbish, you know. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, as, as well, what are the prohibitions against standing up and saying no? I'm sure all the, I'm sure the women in this room have had experience with saying no <laughs> and finding out what happens when you say no. I, I, I would like to, to add some uh, brief clinical example that happened 30 years ago. Talking about pregnancy, well, 30 years ago, 
in my clinical experience during my first pregnancy. I had a, a patient male, and obviously when he could see or could confirm that I was pregnancy, he confirmed that he was excluded, at least from some fantasy of relationship with me. But from the relationship between mother and son, because at the same time, he played in the relationship with women, more passivity or more a passive role, and he was seduced or conquist for the women. And at some point of my pregnancy, I think that it was seven, I was in the seven month. He said one day he came and he said, okay, I know that I would like to be your lover. And I said, well, <laughs> I, I, I was in shock because, <laughs> you know, the stereotypes is a pregnancy woman could be not attracted that I, I never thought in this way. But at the same time, I had this society um, idea um, or stigmatization. And he said, and I, I asked him, why my lover? Well, because I want to be in active position, in active way. And the preg my pregnancy was irrelevant at this point. But my pregnancy was important in order to open the door that when he feel excluded from this relationship with the mother via transparent, he could develop, he could become more active in the way to become a lover, the lover, not the loved, not the child, the loved, the lover. That's, that's extremely interesting, isn't it? You know, like I've never quite heard that connection of um you know because she presumably as this pregnant woman appeared to him the acme of activity of some kind <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know and he couldn't stand that and he was excluded and he he wanted to be big like her you know but, but yes and i it think that they would be to get inside her you know yeah yeah i think that was i emphasize this role of being a lover in terms of reinforce the her his activity his his yeah. uh, capability of being a lover and conquest and to go for no being yeah. receiving no no receiving no more going more to giving yes 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 that's... but i allow myself to expose to the uncomfortable situation i think that it facilitates that he could allow himself to communicate this fantasy yes absolutely yeah it's so we were both we were we were both very young at that time <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. It sounds great, and he probably. How did he do in treatment? Did he, did he stay for a while? Did he, did he develop beyond that? <laughs> did he... Yeah, but it was very interesting because it was a, a huge change in his emotional position, in his emotional interaction, sexual interaction with uh, women. Oh. He changed and he was more active. He became psychologist and he became more active in terms of her in his interventions, in classes. It, it, it was, he became a lover in different ways, you no know, more widely. Uh -huh. Yes. Prescinding of, you know, and I was excluded, obviously, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm looking at the time. I I am so thrilled to finally get Rosemary here to Chicago, even if it's on a video screen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much. And greetings from Sid. <laughs> thank you for. <laughs> oh, say hello to Sid. <laughs> and it really was wonderful to be with you all. Love to see you. Everybody's everybody's Thank doing you. this. They're not waving. They're doing this. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Say hello to, say hello to Paul. Oh, I will. Totally. Good. Good. Thank you. And just to remind everybody, next uh our May meeting has been moved to the 18th, is it Susan? Howard Levin will be here and then we'll wrap up the year with 
Rajiv Gulati and David Pauli's reinterpretation of the Leonardo paper, Freud's Leonardo paper, which is full of problems and they will point them out to us. So we'll see you all next month. Bye now. Bye.